Hey, it's Dr. Jack Wolfson here, cardiologist. This is the Healthy Heart Show. You are in the right place if you want information about holistic heart health and wellness. And today, I'm so excited. I got this fantastic, it seems like I'm always excited with my guests because I'm getting some of the greatest people to talk about health and wellness. And Randy Hartnell, the president, CEO, founder of Vital Choice, seafoodvitalchoice.com. Uh, it, it's a privilege to have you on because providing some of the best seafood in the world to the world and seafood is so important for total body health and wellness and certainly cardiovascular health and uh it's it's truly an honor to you know to have you on so thank you tell me tell me how you got into uh, tell me tell me uh your first memories of seafood Aha. Uh -huh. Well, that probably would have been when I was about four years old and my dad had been out on a fishing boat and he brought a salmon home. And I remember that big old salmon sitting on the counter in her uh, kitchen. Uh, that was probably my first recollection, just the, the smell of it, the look of it, the, the sea creature sitting in our kitchen. And uh, uh, ultimately, I became a fisherman myself and uh, seafood has been a big part of my life for decades now. And where did you grow up? I grew up in the uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, Everett, Washington, and Bellingham, Washington. So you're getting the best sea, uh, seafood up there, of course. You're getting tremendous, uh, you know, obviously high-quality salmon, some of the best of the best. Uh, what were some of those other seafoods that maybe Dad brought home when you were a kid? Was it salmon? What else? You know, that's uh, he wasn't a full-time fisherman. He had just gone out with one of his buddies, uh, you know, and caught some fish on, on his friend's uh, I think Gildnetter at the time. I didn't really start uh, enjoying seafood uh, intensively until I became a commercial fisherman myself. Back when I was in college, I started going up to Alaska uh, to work as a fisherman uh, through the summers and uh, kind of fell in love with that lifestyle and ended up becoming a full-time professional fisherman myself. So. All right, so I'm I'm starting to piece this together because I, I I've only met you on a couple occasions, and I'm always like the guy who's standing around getting all the different samples that you're passing out at the conferences, and I absolutely love it. Um, you know, one uh, one of the conferences you and I were at together was Virgin's Mindshare, and mm -hmm. uh, it was just full of vital choice seafood, and I was just soaking it all in. When you talk about your time as a commercial fisherman, that reminds me of what you probably did when they were kind of soliciting for us, uh, us, you know, college uh, kids at the time, and hey, come up to Alaska and you're gonna earn all this money for the summertime. You're one of the survivors, because I know people who went up there and they didn't last too long, <laughs> they, they came back pretty quick. Uh, well, you know, I went up one year as uh, to work on the processing boat, and that's where you're working long hours and you're not making a whole lot. Uh, sometimes the kids can bring home a fair amount of money because they don't have any way to spend it. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would watch the boats come and deliver the salmon uh, to us, and uh, I figured out pretty quickly that I wanted to be on a fishing boat and not on a processing ship. And so the very next year, I got a, uh, had an opportunity to do that, and... Uh, like I said, I just kind of fell in love with that lifestyle. Did it for 20 years and probably would still be doing it, but uh, it was a disruption in our industry uh, back around 2000 where uh, farm salmon had kind of exploded on world markets. Grocery stores loved it. Gro uh, restaurants and chefs loved it. And uh, almost overnight, we lost our markets. We were still catching a lot of salmon, but they just, uh, the, the, the value plunged. And so I knew when I got to the end of, I think it was 2001 season and I couldn't, I'd caught a lot of salmon, these beautiful, sustainable wild salmon, but uh, they weren't worth enough to be able to even pay my crew or pay my bills that I had to find something else to do. And, and uh, that ultimately led to a uh, vital choice. What, what's the problem with farm salmon? Why, why, why is that? <laughs> except for the fact that it killed some of the, uh, the wild salmon industry and some of the profitability maybe in a, you know, back in, in the day, why is there a difference between wild and farm raised salmon? Well, it's kind of like the difference between wild bison or wild, you know, grass fed beef and factory farmed alternatives, factory farm beef. They're not eating what they're meant to eat. It's totally different nutritional profile. Uh, there's, a lot of serious environmental uh, problems uh, related to uh, farm salmon. It's really a matter of how, how much time do you have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you there's know, a whole, I, I, there's a whole series of issues on the nutritional side. 
and then a whole series of issues on the environmental side. And I know we don't have a whole lot of time to talk about it, so I would just uh, advise any of your uh, listeners who's, who are concerned about that or curious about that, just Google farm salmon and uh, there'll be plenty of information there. That, Especially you know, and when I do my presentations as well, and I just show a, an image that I ripped off of Google. So you go to Google Images and punch up farm salmon, and you'll see just some, some catastrophic things uh, in, in there. And it's, it's essentially, yeah, would you, eat, uh, would you eat fish out of your fish tank? And the answer, of course, uh, is, is no. You know, and I think, you know, when you go to, when you kind of made the, the uh, similarity to, to the meat industry, the beef industry, can you imagine if you, cause, you know, because restaurants will brag, you know, we've got the finest Nebraska corn fed beef going. Can you imagine if you got onto a restaurant and they, were, they advertise salmon? They never say that it's farm raised salmon. They'll either call it salmon. If it's wild, they typically will label it as wild, but they're not going to say, can you imagine where it was like, Nebraska corn fed salmon or yeah, this is our GMO fed salmon or this is our salmon with artificial colors to give it the pink salmon color that uh, that it wouldn't have otherwise. No, they get pretty creative actually uh, ranging from uh, just outright misstating what it is. A lot of times they'll say it's wild when more than half the time it's not. I've had this happen to me several times in the last year. I'll go into restaurants, it'll say wild and then you discover that it's not, uh, or, if, or if it is farm, they'll uh, they come up with all kinds of catchy uh, names to describe it. You know, organic or uh, Scottish or you know, shall I, there are a lot of different ways they uh, try to embellish uh, basically what it is. So, so Randy, how do we know? How do we know for sure that we're going to a restaurant and it's uh, you know maybe maybe they've got two salmon options and the Copper River salmon is forty five dollars for the entree and the Atlantic salmon's twenty five. How do we know uh, if they're you know what's the difference? Well, I would say as a general rule, my experience is just assume it's farm salmon. If they're going to all the trouble to source truly wild, you know, a premium wild product, they're paying more for it. They're uh, they're going to, you know, feature that uh, this is wild Alaskan or this is you know, Copper River uh, salmon. But you'll almost never see that. It's very generic. Uh, the reference is very generic. And uh, I, I always tell people, ask the waitress if or waiter if they act like they don't know, they have to go ask the chef. It's almost guaranteed it's going to be farm salmon all that's, that's my that's my tip certainly randy is always speak to the chef and and obviously you can only hope that they're being honest you know with you and, <laughs> and their integrity but we always speak and we and frankly we always call and we speak to the chef before we even go to the restaurant uh in our house you know, in our household uh, that's for sure to make sure it's on the up and up and uh, you know typically i think if you're going to your local neighborhood uh restaurant or certainly one of your big box uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, chain restaurants. It's it's certainly not going to be wild. And let me tell you, I, I hope you don't cringe with this. As a kid, I remember uh, my uh, we went fishing on Lake Michigan, and we pulled out some coho salmon and a lot of it, and we took it. And one of my dad's partners, my dad was a cardiologist. One of his cardiology partners took it to a place, had it all smoked, and we ate smoked coho salmon in Michigan for for months. So. I've heard there's some beautiful cohos in uh, in the Great Lakes. Uh, I've never were, experienced it, but uh, they were tasty. I don't know. I don't know necessarily their nutrition of value or their toxicity value. I guess I'm still alive. My father is not alive. Uh, he died at the age of 63. So maybe there's. I, I can't. I'm not going to blame it all. I got. I got a lot of reasons to blame my father's uh, uh, passing uh, on that. Uh, tell me what's going on over at Vital Choice um, uh, and, and why people need to come over to Vital Choice to get their seafood. Well, I, I, if I backing up to when I got out of fishing, I, you know, it was a devastating time for myself and a lot of people. It's like I said, we, we just absolutely loved this lifestyle, the, sort of the last of the hunter-gatherers. You've got these fish, you know, this food that people have been eating for tens of thousands of years, and it was just kind of a primal uh, occupation. But anyway, I had to trans transition into uh, something else. And that, uh, like I said, ultimately became Vital Choice. It really, really, it started with me going out and trying to educate people about the differences between wild and farmed salmon. Because at that time, you know, 18 years ago, whatever, uh, nobody really knew the difference. 
And as you know, Jack, most people that are that pay attention to health and nutrition, they've figured out the difference. They want wild, they don't want farm for some of the reasons that we've talked about. But I uh, back then, I just went out and started, I'd take my barbecue and my uh, my Alaska salmon and I'd go get, get a slot in front of uh, Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or Wild Oats and just tell the story. This is why, these are all the benefits of wild salmon, these are the problems of farm salmon. And what I discovered was uh, when people learned the difference, they absolutely wanted wild, but they couldn't find it. And so uh, that eventually led to me uh, promising to ship some salmon to, to one uh, individual who was distressed that she couldn't find it. And uh, that led to basically building our company sort of on the Omaha Steaks model. We're shipping, I would go to Alaska, I would use my connections, my knowledge, my high standards. You know, if you were a, a fisherman, you'd been doing this for 20 years, you'd know where to go to find the very best fish. You wouldn't settle for second, second best. And so that's what I started doing, just uh, sourcing the best salmon I could find and shipping it to people. And we've been doing that now for seven, about 17 years. And uh, I, you know, my business partner uh, has been fishing in Alaska even longer than I, than I uh, was. Uh, we have several people, my, my brother, my, uh, uh, our, some of our employees that still go to Alaska as commercial people. So the takeaway is that we know salmon. We know wild salmon. We're passionate about it. Uh, you know, if you look at all the salmon, even the wild salmon that are harvested in Alaska and other places in the world, there's a quality spectrum or a continuum from the lowest quality wild salmon to the very best quality. That uh, basically reflects, you know, how it's caught, where, when, what catch method, uh, how it's handled after it's caught. And we understand all the smoke and mirrors and, uh, that are used to sell the products that are maybe not so good for one reason or another. So we just go to people we know, we trust. Some of them are like family, we've known them for so long. We source the very best fish, and that's what we make available to our customers. And that way, you, uh, you don't have to worry about being deceived and falling victim to all the fraud in the market. Uh, I mean, every year there are more studies out. 50, 60, 70% of the wild salmon in supermarkets is uh, mislabeled. I'm not saying you know credible stores like Whole Foods and. Uh, some of the you know, more reputable stores uh, don't have good wild salmon. They do, and if you find it, uh, I encourage you to buy it from them. But uh, even even then, they're not always getting the very best product. They're you know it can be kind of uh, the quality can be kind of a hit and miss. And so we we promise you know we're where you're going to get consistently good fish and uh, that's really our story you know and we want people to be happy we everything has a 100% satisfaction guarantee and we like i said we've been growing grown every year for 17 years just based on delivering what we say we're going to deliver and that's not always that easy out there especially when it comes to seafood um, obviously a lot of people you know and I, i'm such a huge huge seafood fan we eat it in our house uh, five to six servings uh, per week. I'm a big fan of anchovies and sardines and the wild salmon. And I love shellfish. I love all that stuff. Um, what what uh, I know what I say to people when my patients uh, ask me or we get emails about is seafood still safe? Is seafood still safe? And of course, uh, Fukushima story. Um, is seafood still safe? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, this is something we understand. We understand that people are concerned about it. There, it makes great headlines, you know. It, uh, and, uh, it's classic clickbait to say that all sam, all seafood is radiated, and uh, uh, we probably spent more on testing to reassure our customers since Fukushima uh, than any other seafood company in America, because we are, you know, we, we've grown. We've got a lot of customers all over the country, and they're concerned. So we. Uh, from right out of the gate after the that tragedy happened we started sending samples of our pacific salmon and halibut and cod and i think 16 different species we sent uh, we went out and found the best lab credible lab uh, eurofins and we sent them uh, all these samples and we've basically been sending them samples uh, off and on ever since it's probably been over a year now because there's just never been anything to re uh, raise concerns and very reassuring 
uh, I had one doctor send me an email here just, a, I don't know, a month or so ago. And he said, Randy, this is the most reassuring thing I've read about why I don't need, you know, we don't need to be concerned about radiation and our seafood. I think the book is called uh, Strange Glow, and it's all about radiation. Mm. And there's a section in there that talks about Fukushima. Basically, it's what we've, been, we've heard from other scientists, and that is uh, the, the incredible dilutive power of, uh, of trillions and trillions of gallons of water in the Pacific Ocean. That uh, a lot of the radiation, those isotopes that came from that uh, that uh, reactor, have dissipated and are no longer there. But there are some longer, you know, one, ones with longer half lives that are, but they they have not uh, uh, impacted the seafood. Yeah, you know, because you know when people tell me that, I, I say, well, first off, you know, in a in a kind of fatalistic or fatalistic kind of way, the whole planet's destroyed. You know, uh, you know, the, the cabbage that's grown in California, you know, to uh, you know, to the dandelion greens in the Midwest. I mean, it's like I mean, it, everything's got their their share with it. And obviously, we do the best we can. And that uh, the, the the any concerns are really far, far, far outweighed by the nutritional benefits. That's such a fantastic point. Seafood. That's such a fantastic point. And that same thing with methylmercury, as you know. I mean, there are trace levels of methylmercury in anything that swims around in the ocean, but it's all about the dose. Uh, you know, the dose makes the poison. And the, the levels of methylmercury in seafood are so small. And most, most of the type of seafood that, well, all the seafood that we, uh, that we source and sell and uh, in general, most of the seafood you buy in grocery stores is not uh, of concern. I mean, you only have to go to uh, nations, uh, ocean, uh, uh, places like Japan, uh, a place where they eat 10, 15, 20 times more seafood than, mm. than Americans. And they're, they're some of the healthiest people on the planet, the longest living and, and not the sickest. So uh, really, it is all about... Uh, uh, benefit, risk versus benefit. Well, I think it's it, it is a total tra tragedy that for years the U.S. government has been and the doctors, you know, complicit. And, and doctors know nothing about nutrition. Of course, I went through ten years of medical training. We never talked about nutrition once, um, except for what what kind of you know what kind of uh, you know burritos we were ordering in in Chicago <laughs> and what kind of you know, who yeah. was making the fast food run or eating out of the hospital cafeteria. Mm -hmm. That was nutrition conversation. But the fact that they would have advised um, uh, you know, pregnant women uh, to, you know, to uh, eat these, eat these kind of, not eat seafood, I think is a major, major catastrophe. And, uh, and, and just, you know, the, the benefits to developing fetus is not there, uh, because they're not getting in those omega-3 fats that the babies need for their brain. I think it's a total catastrophe. I have no doubt that it led to a tremendous amount of disease uh, to, you know, it, maybe even some of the autism. You know, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the neurologic things that are, you know, uh, neurodevelopmental uh, disorders that these children have, of which autism is one of them. Um, uh, and, and, and I think finally, I think, uh, I think science is starting to come around and saying, hey, you know, we got to get these women back eating seafood again. And the most recent studies I looked at, frankly, that says that, yeah, there's, there may be mercury in the seafood and there may be mercury getting in a mom, but that seafood mercury has no impact on the child's neurodevelopmental, you know, issues. Yeah, one of the biggest uh, studies that's been done on uh, methylmercury in pregnant moms uh, was conducted in uh, the UK. It was called the ALSPAC study, Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. Looked at 14,000 mother uh, infant pairs, and uh, going in, they, they tested the women for blood merc or mercury levels, and uh, there was an association between the amount of seafood they were eating and the levels of mercury that they had. And they, Fully expected as they tested these kids going forward that you know as they grew up that they would find neurological problems and the kids born of the moms who ate the most fish had the highest mercury levels. They concluded it was just the opposite. It was the women who weren't eating fish that had the kids with the most developmental problems, most neurological problems. And they published in Lancet. I think uh, it was uh, Joe Hiblin was the lead author on this mm. this uh, paper. Uh, basically said that advice to pregnant women to avoid seafood is uh, risk causing the harm it's intended to prevent. And based on that study, and uh, uh, there's one other uh, very credible study in the Seychelles Islands that essentially found the same thing. Uh, they petitioned Margaret Hamburg at, at the uh, FDA at that time to change this 
advisory to pregnant nursing women. Uh, the advisory came out in 2004, basically telling them to limit their seafood consumption. And, uh, and really, it was only to pregnant and nursing women, but it got picked up and basically uh, seafood's consumption in the United States started declining after that. Mm. So they petitioned uh, uh, Margaret Hamburg at the FDA, look it, this is causing harm. You guys need to change this. And ultimately, after two to three years and a whole lot of uh, effort on the part of about 200 scientists, uh, they, they did agree to change it modestly. Rather than max a maximum of two portions per week, it, it was a minimum of two portions a week. Yeah. You know? But uh, in any event, uh, yeah, the the evidence. If you really look at the science and the evidence, it's uh, it's much more harmful to avoid seafood, especially for pregnant nursing women, uh, than it is to consume it. And I think I mean I mean listen, and, and as I tell those women, you know, wild salmon is always a fantastic choice. You know, very very very. You would know as far as, you know, the detectability, but I know when I check people's levels for circulating metals, we're not finding it in the wild salmon eaters. We're not finding it in those that eat sardines, uh, you know, the anchovies, some of the smaller fish. You know, I don't know if you know this about me, you know, at all, Randy, you probably don't, but I'm the guy on the airplane who opens up a can of sardines. <laughs> you're my kind of guy. No one, no <laughs> one like. you're probably the only one that does it too. No one likes that guy. That guy's the <laughs> But a can of sardines is the perfect travel food. You know, the, the problem is, is that people, one of the problems, you know, when people travel and when you're hungry and you're not prepared, the only thing is fast food. But when you bring things like the can of sardines, you bring the avocado on the plane, the, you know, the nuts and seeds, you got to be prepared. And then mm -hmm. another one of my favorite things I tell everybody is, you know, to, the, the make your own salad dressing recipe. And in there, that's when you dump in the anchovies or the, you get that pulverized into the salad dressing. And once you put in your lemon and your apple cider vinegar, you can serve it to anybody and uh, they're not going to get like that fishy taste. Even, so even those that are most averse you know, to it, there's, there's definitely other strategies. That's fantastic. Yeah, we, uh, we import some really wonderful uh, sardines, fresh packed sardines from Portugal. And uh, just this year, we... I was over visiting and watching them put up our pack here a year or so ago, and they they showed me they handed me this little can, like a two ounce can of of their sardines, and they said they call them pocket sardines because you put them in your pocket and you take them to work for lunch or you know, whatever. So we started carrying those, and those are very popular too, and would be great for the airplane. Uh, fantastic, you know, and certainly when you, whenever whenever someone says put something in the pocket, I, I I would say it's much healthier to put the sardines in your pocket than to put a cell phone into your shirt pocket. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> you know that's the cell phone. So many people, especially women, maybe they'll tuck in their cell phone into their into their breast pocket, the electronic device sitting on top of their electronic controlled heart. Um, tell me. Tell me, if you will, about mackerel, because mackerel, there's all different species of mackerel, and they tell us to avoid the large mackerel, the king mackerel, but the smaller mackerel is uh, better and safer and on and on. Uh, t tell me about it. Well, we discovered uh, the small chub mackerel when we started importing the uh, sardines. I went over to Portugal. I actually went over there to, to meet with some people that were growing or had an organic olive oil orchard, and we never ended up doing business with them, but they introduced us to our friends who are fifth generation uh, owners of a sardine processing facility in uh, Porto. And uh, so we started uh, importing the, the sardines, and we learned that they also catch these little mackerel. They're the same size as sardines, but uh, they're flavor wise, they're like a almost a blend uh, between sardines and tuna. Yeah, it's really delicious and very high in omega threes. Clean, you know, pure. Not a, uh, the metal, the contaminant issue is really not there. So they're something we've been bringing in for uh, over ten years now. Very, uh, you know, the the whole issue with uh, avoid mackerel. It's a lot like uh, people just generalize say avoid tuna. Well, you know, there's five hundred pound tuna that have been out there for forty years bioaccumulating methylmercury in there skipjack tuna or even young uh, albacore that are two three years old and super high omega-3 levels and uh, and relatively low uh, 
contaminant level. So it goes back to that risk benefit thing. If you buy a you know an albacore tuna in the grocery store, that's usually caught in such a way that it's the much larger tuna their, and their oil uh, omega-3 levels are not usually that high compared to the smaller ones that are hook and line caught at the surface. Uh, uh, much lower contaminants, much higher omega-3 levels. So it, it pays to be selective. That's another thing that we do, and you know, apart from salmon, when we uh, go out and source halibut or tuna or other things, we're basically doing what you would do. We're uh, sourcing the versions of those other fish that we want to eat, the safest, cleanest, uh, uh, best best one. So a halibut, for example, we these are fish that are weigh hundreds of pounds and, and live many decades. And we source only 25 pounds and under. They're part of every delivery. The fisherman come in, he's got the great big ones and he's got the little ones. And most processors tend to like the, the big ones because the yield is higher, they're cheaper to process. Uh, but we started uh, sourcing the smaller ones. They're, they cost more to process, but you know, cleaner, uh, just uh, safer. It's, it's the type of fish you want to be eating. So you've done all the homework for us. I mean, that's that's absolutely incredible, Ian, you know, that you've done that. We we so appreciate that. And and that's just the thing is that hey, listen, you know, you're 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 a lawyer, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, you're a business professional. Who's got time to sit there and find out all these questions? And who wants to even deal with all these questions? You go to Vital Choice, and you know, Randy and his team have done all the work for us. And you uh, are you going to pay more for it? You are, but you know what? Your health is worth it. It's quite, and we tell this to patients all day long. You know what? I really think you're worth it. You spending more money on yourself, and if, if you want to do yourself a favor, cut out, uh, you know, your your you know your ten dollar a day coffee habit, you know, from the local coffee shop, and and you get you know stop getting your hair done and your nails done. Start spending the money on on your health and wellness. And uh, there's nothing more nutritious than seafood. And another thing I tell people, Randy, for those people that are vegans out there, please start eating seafood. Uh, why, uh, Randy, answer this question for me. Why can't a vegan, why, why doesn't a vegan eat an oyster? Like, does an oyster have any more or less feelings than a head of cabbage? <laughs> I mean, I mean, do we know that? Um, you know, if we're doing it for ethical reasons, yeah, I mean, there are like, a lot of different. Reasons. It's an oyster. There are different reasons that people are vegan. I've ter- uh, you know, learned over the years, and uh, one one discussion that I've had with vegans in the past that seems to resonate with them is I tell them the story of sockeye salmon, these wild sockeye salmon. Uh, these fish live four years. They live about three point nine of those four years as nature intended. They're bored in the rivers, they migrate out to the sea, they become adults, and at the end of their lives, the last stage of their odyssey, they come back to those those same rivers, and they lay their uh, eggs, and they die. And they, they spawn and they die. And the way the fisheries in Alaska work is uh, there are scientists or biologists that are managing those fisheries. They figured out 50 years ago how many fish they need to get up the rivers to perpetuate the run. And anything over that, they let the fishermen take. So as a fisherman for 20 years up there, I participated in this management uh, system, I know it intimately. Uh, we wouldn't get to fish unless that biologist that was in charge of that river was knew that he was going to get, in my river, it was 2 million fish. Okay. Those fish are going to die anyway. There are 135 other species that survive, consume those sockeye throughout the course of their life cycle, bears and eagles and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, You know, why would it be, uh, why should we deprive ourselves? Why why can't we be one of those 135? And also that uh, that sockeye salmon has has lived his whole life as nature intended or her life or whatever. uh, it's just a, a really a beautiful story. It's uh, the, the fish is one of the most natural, real foods you're go, you're ever going to going to find. And uh, I don't know. I've had uh, had luck telling people that because it's if you're worried about the humane mm-hmm. side of it or the ethical side of it, it's uh, it's really a beautiful system. It's one of the most sustainable yeah. foods on the planet. And uh, in a way, if you've ever been up in the rivers and you watch the what happens to those salmon from the time they come out of the ocean in prime condition, that's when they're caught, and they enter that fresh water to go back up and spawn. Sometimes it can be weeks, depending on how, how long they are going to be swimming. 
it's almost like fishing as euthanasia. Uh -huh. <laughs> they don't feed. They're basically starving to death. They're living off their stored calories. They get up there. They're totally spent. The birds are they're plopping around, and the animals are eating them alive. And the birds are pecking their eyes out. And it's uh, wow. You know, it's uh, you know, as opposed to being caught the prime of their lives. So, so anyway, for people that are worried about we're catching the last salmon, that's not. That's not legitimate. And well, thank God for that. Uh, you know, there better be a lot. You know, uh, you know, for us. And listen, you know, you know, you and I don't make the rules. The rules are from Mother Nature, and Mother Nature said uh, humans are seafood eaters. That's all there is to it. That's how it's been for for a million years. It's not going away anytime soon. Uh, and when you're getting the best of the best from a company like VitalChoice.com. Uh, you know, you can uh, you can rest assured that it's best for you. It's best for the environment. Uh, and according to uh, Randy Hardnell, it's best for the for the salmon as well. I would agree with you. It's probably you know, listen, you know, it, it kill me slowly as opposed to a, uh, I'm sorry, kill me quickly as opposed to a bird, you know, pecking out my eyes and a, a bear, you know, struggling to catch me and I'm getting scraped and this and that. Uh, I'm sure your way is a lot more ethical than what they're. Doing. I, I just want to throw in too, Jack, that this past summer. 2018 up in uh, Bristol Bay where I used to fish they had the biggest return of sockeye salmon they've had since they've been keeping records in 1952 60 million sockeye came back they only needed uh, you know a small number of those to populate the different river systems five or six river systems and uh, so it was a field day for the uh, fishermen it was great for the market uh, one thing that's different from the time I was fishing is uh, pretty much every salmon that I caught went to Japan Americans weren't really eating much wild salmon, but but that's changed. So the market is strong. The fishermen are making a good living, and uh, the, the nature is producing. Love it. Ladies and gentlemen, Randy Hardnell of Vital Choice, uh, seafoodvitalchoice.com. Go check out his website, and you're going to get the best of the best and reap the health benefits. Randy, thanks so much for being on the Healthy Heart Show. Jack, my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. We'll talk to you again. Be well. I know.